Hello everyone, this is Homer Hoyt back again, this time with some tips about making R Markdown documents. By now you've become somewhat familiar with uh, writing some code in R, and I'd like to show you how it can be much more convenient for you to write about statistics and talk about analysis using R Markdown document format. So let's start with a simple new R Markdown document. We're going to go to File and ask to make a new file. And we would like to make an R Markdown file. What comes up in the screen is a simple sample R Markdown document. It gives you a couple of examples of what can be done. Now that we have this document, let's save it give it a nice name. So we'll save it as, how about, uh, my first R Markdown document. And I'll save it in my home folder. There we go. And we see it in our home folder. Now, let's take the suggestion contained inside the document to knit to HTML. Let's push this button here and see what happens. A web page shows up in preview form. What we see is some code, a summary of a data set called cars, and here is the output of that code that would have gone to the console had the command summary of cars been run in R itself. Next up was a command to plot a couple of variables associated with the cars data frame. And a scatter plot appears afterwards. That's the result of the command if it had been run in R itself. But we also have just regular text and discussion along with the code and its output. An R Markdown document allows you to interweave your discussion, your writing, your text, and your analysis with the code that you need in order to do data analysis, as well as the output of that code. So it's a great way to compose in data analysis. Let's close this file. So in your files pane, after you've knit an HTML, You'll see the original R Markdown document. You'll also see a file called myfirst.markdown. We won't concern ourselves too much with markdown documents. They're just a step on the way to producing the myfirst HTML document, which you, which you saw in preview form in that separate little window. Now that that HTML document has been made, you can look at it again. If you click on it, then you have the option to view it in the web browser and up it comes in a separate pane of Mozilla or related browsers. So what we would like to do is talk about how to make these R Markdown documents to begin to use them to turn in simple assignments. Ultimately if you do a data analysis project this is the way that you would write up your data analysis project. Okay, so why don't we begin by simply wiping this document clean and making a very small R Markdown document ourselves, right from scratch. So let me type some text. Uh, here is uh, a document. Now, I plan to uh, use some functions and some data sets that come from our contributed packages such as Mosaic and TigerStats. I'm going to need to make sure that this document knows to load them because this document starts from scratch. It doesn't have these, these uh, packages already loaded. So there needs to be code that loads these packages. How shall we get that code into the document? Well, we need to separate code from text. And the way that's done is with, is with some special code separators. If you go to chunks, you'll see the option to insert a chunk. 
a chunk of code. The keyboard shortcut for that is Control-Alt-I, which you should learn to use, but I'll just go ahead and push Insert Chunk. And what comes up is the separating material. It's three backticks, followed by an R in brackets, and then another three backticks. The backticks separate the text, such as here is a document, from the code that's going to go inside the special highlighted chunk. The R in brackets tells the computer that the R language is what's going to be inside this chunk. So if I get inside the chunk with my cursor, I can now type in some R code. For example, I can type in the code to load packages, such as require mosaic and require tiger stats. That's a code chunk. Now, let's run a function. How about uh, statistics for fastest speed driven in the MAT111 survey data. So there's my text warning the reader that some statistics are coming up. And let's insert another chunk. I'll do the Control, Alt, and I key to get the chunk quickly. I'll move my cursor down into the chunk itself. And how about fave stats for fastest speed ever driven? Data equals M111 survey. Now remember, we can only uh, use this command if the Math 111 survey data is in our search path. And for that, the package that contains it, namely the Tiger Stats package, has to be loaded. Also, Fave Stats is a function that's inside the Mosaic package, so that has to be loaded as well. That's why we had the code chunk for requiring those packages previous to this code chunk. Why don't we just check and see how the HTML document is shaping up? Let's press knit HTML and see if things are working out like we expect them to. Things look okay. Here's the original text. And then here is the command require mosaic, followed by a lot of verbiage that R would deliver to the console when it's loading package mosaic. Next up comes the command require tiger stats and the messages that R would send to the console when it loads that package. Then here's our text. Let's run a function. And here is the code. Notice how the code is nicely highlighted by different colors so as to draw the reader's attention to it. And here we see the familiar output of phase stats. Things are shaping up okay, except we probably don't want to see all of these messages to the console inside of the screen like this. Is there a way we can suppress them? Let's close this out. There actually is such a way. If you don't want to see those messages, and in fact, if you don't really need to see the code itself, you could say include equals false. This will hide the code chunk in the HTML document, and it will also hide any messages that appear in the console. Let's knit and see how this looks. So you should know that R actually loaded Mosaic and Tiger Stats and so that it was able to run the Phase Stats command on the Math 111 survey data. But it hid all of that activity from the reader. If the reader is not concerned with the technical details of loading packages, why show the reader all of that information? But suppose that you really only want to show the reader the output. Maybe the reader doesn't know R and doesn't know anything or care anything about the fave stats command. If you would like to hide the code, you can also say echo equals false. Now let's see how it will knit.
Now we just see the output and we could go on in the document and talk about what that output means. Perhaps we'd also like to make a plot. So we warn the reader that a density plot is coming up. Control-Alt-I inserts the code chunk separators. Once again, let's hide the code from the reader. So we'll say echo equals false. And density plot twiddles fastest. Data equals M111 survey. And of course, I should add some arguments to give a title and a nice label. So I'll go and do that. Okay, that looks about right. If you're ever interested in checking before you knit to see whether your code works, you can actually run the code. If you or yourself have the packages already loaded in your own file, let's see if I do. I see Mosaic, I see Tiger Stats, then I should in principle be able to run this block of code right here. A quick way to run it is just to make sure that your cursor is somewhere inside the code chunk, anywhere inside really. And if you go to Chunks, you have the option to run the current chunk, the one that your cursor is inside. Now the keyboard shortcut for that is Control-Alt-C, and that's a good one to learn, and I'll use it now. Notice that the code itself appears in the console. That means R ran it. And then over in the plot window, we see the density plot. So as you're composing an R Markdown document, you can run your code chunks just to see that everything looks like it's working right and you can correct errors before you begin to knit. Let's see how the knitted document is shaping up. So we have some text, we have the output of the phase stats, and we have a density plot. The code is hidden from the reader and we have a nice density plot for the person to look at and we can go on to discuss what that density plot might mean. Now as I look at it, it seems the density plot is rather large. I wonder if it might be more elegant to have a smaller density plot along with all this text. What could we do? Well, there are many more options that you can put next to the R before you begin your code chunk. Echo is one such option. But if you put fig.width, and you can set it to be various numbers, experiment around to see what kind of sizes you get. I'm going to go with fig.width is 3.5, and fig.height equal to maybe 3. And let's see what uh, happens when we knit. So that's a smaller... A more elegant looking plot. Maybe it's too small. We might want to make the fig width and fig height a little bit bigger and see what we think. Of course, if you're happy with uh, the way that your markdown document is shaping up, don't forget to save it. But the nice thing is that whenever you ask to knit an HTML, it automatically saves the current version of the document. Since we just knit, the version that we have in front of us is already saved. I'd like to look now at another sample document to show you a little bit more how things can work together and how your options might look and some other things that you can do when you make an R Markdown document. So I'm going to open up a sample document in .rmd form. And let's go right away to knit it up and see what we've got.
This looks kind of nice. We've got what looks like a title in the largest print that we see on the screen. Uh, we've said who's written it and when. And then these appear to be sections. So something about a research question. Looks like we are regarding the general social survey from the year 2002. That's the uh, data frame GSS02 from the Tiger Stats package. Say we're interested in this research question, which has been nicely set off here in kind of a block quote. Is there a relationship in the U.S. population between race and gun ownership? And then we talk about how we're going to first look at the question descriptively and then inferentially. And there appears to be another subsection, descriptive aspect. It appears that we've run some code to get the structure of GSS02. And that's where we find out that the variables of interest, race and capital punishment, are factors. Notice that we appear to have been able to make some nice bullet list items where we describe race and gun ownership in a bullet list. And it looks like we can even make sub-bullet lists where we're giving the values of race and the values of gun ownership. Looks like next we uh, talked about how we were going to produce a two-way table. And we see the output of the table here. But notice that we've hidden the code from the reader, perhaps because we don't think the reader is interested in how the table is produced in R. They just want to see the table. Similarly, for the table of row percents that we use to see whether or not there is a relationship between these two factor variables, race and gun ownership. And here's some nice text discussing what the row percents tell us. So a wonderful way of interweaving calculations and discussion and analysis. That's what you can do with an R Markdown document. Here comes another section where we address the inferential aspect of the research question. It appears that we're going to set up a chi-square test it looks like this block quote here sets up the null and alternative hypotheses in a chi-square test. And this next block appears to be the output of a chi-square test. The code for it has been hidden from the reader. And here's our discussion of that output, talking about what the chi-square statistic was, what the p-value was, what our decision is about the null hypothesis, and our conclusion as well. So, here's some additional notes. Why don't we go back to the source now and see how this is all being produced. So, you'll notice that to get the title, you use one pound sign, a space, and then your title. You do need that space before your title begins. We've loaded our packages using the option include equals false so that the code is hidden and the messages to the console are hidden from the reader. To get sections, you would want two pounds, again a space, and then the title of your section. Your text you type in in the normal way. If you ever want to get um, a typewriter form for your text, you can use backticks, and we often do that around code or names of data frames. So notice the backticks that begin and end GSS02. In the knitted version, you'll see that GSS02 will appear in somewhat more of a typewriter format than the font for the text that surrounds it. That can help make the reader clear that computer code is being talked about. Now, the research question was set off in a block quote, block quote. The way you get a block quote is with the greater than sign. If you tab before your greater than sign, the block quote will be set off even more. So that's a nice thing to do. The block quote was also in italics in HTML. The way you get the italics is to put a star before and after 
the phrase that you want to italicize. Here comes another section, and you can tell because it's got two pound signs. More text. We have a code chunk, and we're not hiding this code. Notice there's no echo equals false option, and so both the code and the output will be shown. Now we come to the part where the bullet items were produced. If you want to make bullet items, you use a star, then a space, and then the item that you want to bullet. Race is a factor variable with values is what will be bulleted. What about race? There's two stars at the beginning and end of that. When you put two stars at the beginning and end of something, then it'll come out in boldface. Now underneath race were the uh, sub-bullet items for the values of race. The way to get sub-items is to type four spaces, then your star, then a space, and then the sub-bullet item. And you can continue for as many sub-items as you want. When you want to go back to items, just get your cursor back to the very beginning of the line, star, and again a space, and then the next item that you would like to type in. Again, own gun, we decided to have it be boldface, and so it's got two stars before and after. Here we have a couple more sub-items under own gun. So whenever you want boldface, you have two stars before and after. Whenever you want italics, you'll have one star before and after. Remember that whenever you want to hide code, you can put an echo equals false for your option. Notice that there is a space between the R and the beginning of your options. The options always appear inside the brackets along with the R. They never appear down with the code. Here we have another section on inferential aspect. I put the null and the alternative hypotheses in block quotes so that they would be more visible to the reader. So that's why you see this tab and then the greater than sign. You will remember from the HTML that the null hypothesis had a subscript of zero and the alternative hypothesis had a subscript of A. To get those subscripts, you go a little bit into math notation. There's a great deal of math notation you could use in our markdown but we'll only use a tiny bit in this course. Math notation is accomplished by putting a dollar sign right before and right after the notation that you want. And so if you want a subscript, then to indicate a subscript, you will put a subscript bar at the between the original item and the subscript itself. More discussion. And in this sample document, there's an extra section that just reviews how you can get things like boldface or italics, how you can get a list of bullet items or bullet items with sub-items, nested lists, how you can get block quotes. And thinking about those titles and sections, here's a complete story on it. The biggest type at the highest level is a title with just one with, with just one pound sign. For sections, two pound signs, and the type will be a little smaller. And then there's three, four, five, and even six levels that you can go to with your subsections and sub subsections and so on. I don't advise using um, going quite so far down the nested list because the type gets very small, sometimes even smaller than the regular type in your text. And here we have again a review of the idea that you could control the size of graphical output by using the figure width and the figure height options. If you have more than one option, in a code chunk, make sure you separate the options with a comma. 
So for example, if you wanted to hide the code for a graph and control the size, then you'll probably have three options. One is echo equal false to hide the code. Another is a number to specify the figure width, and then a number to specify the figure height. There's a great deal more that you could learn about R Markdown in order to produce pretty documents, but this is quite enough to get you started. In a later video, we'll talk about getting output that's even prettier than the HTML that you're seeing right now. Let's take one last look at the HTML as we have it. Sample document R Markdown, but if we want to see the HTML, let's see. We could open the HTML in the web browser, and here's the whole thing. When you study our Markdown documents, it's good to study the source code along with the HTML output in order to get an idea of how to produce different types of output and how to produce a look and feel that seems good for the type of project that you have in mind. Thank you for listening.